Uh, 15 years ago, we published Our Stolen Future. Uh, it was uh, a bestseller, um, pub translated into 15 languages. It explored how, in essence, the core of it was looking at how exposure in the womb to contaminants that behave like hormones alter development and then lead subsequently to diseases later in life. Um, it was a real whirlwind ride. Not everyone liked the book. Uh, we had lots of interesting public debates over it. Um, my most unexpected uh, happening was being invited to meet the emperor and the empress and Princess Nori of Japan in their private quarters for tea. And Princess Nori really loved the book. And when I went to m meet with her, there were 50 little plastic tabs uh, marking some of her favorite passages. Anyway, uh, it's been a wild ride. What this book did, most importantly, what it did was to stimulate, it helped with others involved in the process, but it helped stimulate literally hundreds of millions of dollars of research by governments around the world into asking some of the questions that we and other scientists who were at the time asking. What, what, now we know something is happening. What is happening? Our book was full of questions. It acknowledged the uncertainty. Uh, but in the outpouring of results, and tens of thousands of articles have been written about endocrine disruption in the peer-reviewed literature since we published this book as a result of the investigations, we really know a lot more, a lot more. There still are questions. But what I thought I would do today would be to rise up to 30,000 feet above the scientific plane and tell you about some core themes that have emerged out of that scientific literature. We're actually living in a midst of a scientific revolution based on these findings. And they're changing how we think about the relationships between contamination and health, particularly, and it's perhaps surprisingly because the initial focus was on fetal exposures, but how those fetal exposures contribute to chronic diseases of adulthood. Some of the discoveries in the science have been completely unexpected, including uh, signaling that some of the materials we have embraced and included within our households some that we thought were safe actually are not. For me, the most exciting thing is out of this science have come many opportunities for prevention of disease. Um, I'm going to walk you through what I would regard as the six central themes of, these, of this revolution in science. The first one is that, and this is the most profound, contaminants interact in gene, with genes in ways that not only don't reflect current health standards, but also in ways that the traditional scientific tools used to assess toxicity didn't acknowledge. Second, these interactions can take place at extremely low levels. Can you all hear me when I, I, know, I just realized I was shifting away from the mic? Okay, great. <laughs> Third, exposures in the womb, and this will be a central theme, exposures in the womb can set in motion things that play out over a lifetime. Fourth, these exposures are ubiquitous, everyone experiences them, and they take place in mixtures that can interact in unexpected ways. Fifth, the tools that we have used in toxicology to assess risk are blind to some of these impacts, and, and especially uh, uh, several that I will focus on. And fifth, or sixth, there is now emerging a chemistry called, or science called green chemistry that's using this science to guide new chemical synth syntheses to create a wave of new materials that offer opportunities for innovation, both material innovation and economic innovation, based on materials that are inherently safe. So those are the core themes. I'm going to use this one picture to illustrate three of them. How many of you have seen this picture before? OK. It's, it's from Retha Newbold's work at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, it's the same strain of mouse. Uh, same, they monitored caloric intake over the lifetime of the mouse up to this age, and they monitored the, the activities level, and they were basically not statistically distinguishable. Same activity, same caloric intake, but obviously two very different mice. What's the difference? The fat mouse was exposed to one part per billion of a potent endocrine disrupting chemical right at birth. We now know a lot about the science that makes this happen. It, what's in essence happening is DES and other endocrine disruptors can increase the, the rate of conversion from stem cells to fat cells, so the mouse grows up with a lot more fat cells than it normally would have, and those absorb more lipids, more fat. The second 
part of this message, of this lesson from these mice, is that if the animal had been exposed to 1,000 parts per billion, 1,000 times what it takes to make a, make a mouse fat, it would have been scrawnier than the control. So a high dose experiment doesn't predict what happens at low doses. That's vital when you're considering endocrine disrupting compounds. And third, back to that theme of developmental exposure, development exposure led to obesity in adulthood, which gradually developed over the life of the animal. So key, the three key issues there, low level matters, low levels matter, uh, high dose testing don't predict low dose results, and third, early life exposures can impair adult health. So this new science uh, really focuses on how chemicals interact, certain chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, behaving like hormones, how they interact with genes in ways that we didn't really know was happening 30 years ago. Um, we used to be thinking about toxicity mechanisms like mutagenicity and genotoxicity. Now we have to think about what's called altering gene expression, the control of epigenetics, what's making genes turn on and turn off at key points in development. Genes are being turned on and off throughout your lifetime, literally trillions of times a second. Uh, if they don't happen at the right time or they happen at the wrong time, that potentially sets you up for uh, health problems. I could spend a lot of time on that particular concept. I, unfortunately, our moderator is threatening me with a variety of life-threatening is issues, so I, I will spare you the details. I, you'd love to, I would love to take questions about it. So now we're learning through this science that um, low-level exposures can affect gene expression at levels way beneath the levels necessary to cause overt toxicity, like causing a mutation. The chain, factors affecting gene expression can take place at very low levels. And what are some of the compounds that we know now alter gene expression at low levels? Well, here's a very short list. I'll be going into a little bit of detail on the top one, bisphenol A, as the talk goes on. So um, this science, this revolution in science, um, has led to a series of conceptual shifts in how toxicologists and biologists think about the interaction between contaminants and disease. And a key one is that we used to always think, when we heard that a disease was linked to a gene, we used to think that by definition that meant it was inherited and therefore not preventable. Now, when I hear the Human Genome Project has discovered yet another disease is linked to a gene, I don't ask about the sources of mutation. I ask what contaminants might be altering that gene's expression. It turns out that happens a lot. And that focus then may take us to a place by learning what gene, what contaminant interferes with that gene's expression, that gene being linked to a disease, we can then begin to intervene. It completely changes the, genetic, uh, the, the perception of a genetic-based disease from one of fatalism to one of hope for prevention. It's a game-changing uh, change. So um, another uh, key element of this revolution, which I have touched on briefly, is we used to think that only high levels mattered because you need a high level to mutate something. You need a high level to kill something overtly. But when you're dealing with changes in gene expression, things happen at low levels. Levels uh, that, are, that people commonly experience, levels that couldn't e even be measured 20 years ago. So I'll spend a little bit of time with bisphenol A. Um, and it's really curious why we thought this was safe given the amount of information that we now have about bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is used um, to make polycarbonate bottles. It used to be when I would give this speech uh, or a speech about this subject, I could ask my hand, ask for people to show me their BPA bottles. You know, I, I rarely see one in an audience anymore. Um, in fact, it's hard to buy them in, um, in the US. Uh, bisphenol A was invented in, 18, first synthesized in 1891. It was discovered to be a synthetic estrogen in 1936. They Forgot about that when they began, when chemists began to play with it and discovered it's a really useful material capable of doing many, many different things. It's, a, it's cheap, it's a, it has great characteristics uh, both as a polycarbonate plastic. It's used in lots of different uh, things. Um, it's used to line cans, it's used to make polycarbonate. Recently we discovered it's used to, um, as, as it, it interacts with the dye in uh, thermal paper, in, in print, uh, uh, in thermal receipts. Um, 
When you handle one of those thermal receipts, you transfer bisphenol A in dust onto your skin and it's absorbed. It's absorbed at levels that, you can, that scientists now can show. Uh, it occur, it, within a few hours, it's, they can measure it in your blood. Um, when I'm in a bagel store or someplace like that, I regularly see people holding their bagels in their hands, sticking the receipt in their mouth. I want to rip it out of their mouth. Uh, it's, it's a frightening prospect. Uh, bisphenol A is seen at uh, low levels in people. These are levels from, uh, measured in, um, in a study from Germany in placental tissue and maternal blood and fetal blood. It's parts per billion. And traditional toxicology would have said, what does it matter? Parts per billion couldn't possibly be important. But this science, looking at how low levels, parts per billion levels, alter gene expression, changes that dramatically. This, um, it, it, this exposure is ubiquitous. 95% of Americans, just about 95, almost all people in the developed world uh, are exposed to bisphenol A. Um, this study of low levels got its start with a famous experiment done by a man named Vom Sahl from University of Missouri, where he used some sophisticated math and knowledge of the biochemistry of what happens in the blood to predict that at a very low level, based on his other work, he should see changes in prostate growth in the, in the prostate of mice. He did the experiment and confirmed that his predictions were correct. It was challenged, it's been challenged repeatedly. Uh, I can go into the details as to why I'm convinced that Von Saul got it right. It's, the study has been replicated, actually using some very sophisticated uh, reconstruction of what the growth of a fetal prostate looks like. And you can see here that the, that green in the, in the treated animal is very different from the green, in, which are the growing prostate glands. Uh, you can see, they can confirm visually that the growth trajectories of the exposed mice are very different from the growth trajectories of the unexposed mice. Lots of work, in addition to von Sahl's on, on bisphenol A, has been published over the last um, 10 years. Uh, most, the, the best of it is actually work done by Chuck Mayho and Gail Prinz um, in the US, looking at how exposures to bisphenol A right around birth lead to what are called high pin grade lesions, or high, high grade pin lesions, which are the precursors of, of prostate cancer in people. And most recently, uh, Gail Prinz published a study, and this is crucial for the internal debate about what science to look at and what science to not, not to look at. And one of the key arguments is you can throw out all those academic studies because most of them don't use oral exposures. They, instead, they, have, they use ex systems of exposure which scientists doing the work say is a better replication of how people are exposed. But basically what Gail Prince showed in her most recent work is that the route of exposure doesn't make a difference. Oral or subcutaneous provide, produce the same pattern of impact on high pin grade lesions. So it may be too inside baseball for you, but it's, a, it's an important point. Um, adults aren't immune either. It turns out that adult, expo adult in, in using rat experiments where you implant a prost human prostate tumor into a rat and then play around with it pharmacologically, which is the way that drugs are created for treating prostate cancer in people. Well, if you do that with bisphenol A, uh, it turns out that bisphenol A causes the prostate tumor to escape treatment. It grows faster and it's no longer amenable to the standard treatment used to treat human prostate cancer. A similar uh, work with breast cancer, uh, prenatal exposure to v extremely low levels of bisphenol A causes breast cancer in adult rats. There are a number of studies that show that uh, bisphenol A increases the likelihood of breast cancer in mice. Um, uh, in adult uh, human breast cancer cells in, done in cell systems, um, BPA, like its action on prostate cancer treatment, it interferes with the standard, several of the standard treatments for breast cancer in people, in human cells, at extremely low levels, one part per billion. Um, one of the central themes of this new science is that the, um, uh, instead of just looking at things that people might be related to hormones like sex hormones, now it turns out every hormone system that's been looked at carefully has been found vulnerable to endocrine disruption by contaminants. One of the most important discoveries looks at adiponectin, which is a, a hormone that's excreted by your fat cells. It's vital to protecting you against heart disease and heart attacks. Okay? And what's been found um, is that using experiments with human fat cells, bisphenol A suppresses adiponectin release 
sig very significantly in this inverted U, and I'll get to that issue of inverted U shortly, but right at the, the level at which bisphenol A is most common in people, at about one part per billion, is the maximum suppression of adiponectin in, in cells. This experiment predicts that there ought to be a link between uh, levels of BPA in people and risk of heart disease, and a famous uh, epidemiological study published um, uh, two, year, two years ago by people from England analyzing a very large data set found just that, confirmed that prediction. This was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and you can see the red dots are all significant, so there's a significant relationship between cardiovascular disease, angina, coronary heart disease, heart attack, and type 2 diabetes linked to exposure to, to levels of bisphenol A in people's blood, in people's urine, actually. So I'm going real fast, Jackie. You're doing uh, great. <laughs> the, um, if you look at the animal studies, there are links to animal variations, animal versions of each of these endpoints. We don't have epidemiology yet for many of them, for most of them. We don't have human confirmation. There are scientists actively working today on every one of those links. Now, this is, looks like a very complicated slide. It, actually, conceptually, it's very simple. Um, what it shows, it takes data from lots of different animal experiments, and it shows you in terms of hours after exposure, what are the levels that are in my, the, the blood of the animals? And in each of these experiments, there were adverse effects on the animals, okay? And so the black line is the average, and it looks like the serum levels are pretty low, right? Um, 0.1 part per billion. Well, the crucial question is, well, how does this relate to what's in people? Are the animal experiments, usually we're told that, oh, those rat experiments use doses that are completely irrelevant to people. So how, does, how do these levels compare to the average in people? That's the average level in people in the US. So these animals are being exposed to levels that are lower than those in people, and they're causing adverse effects. There's not a safety factor built in here. Um, the th going back to those central themes, exposures in the womb can play out over a lifetime. I have one very quick example. Um, and it's after breakfast and before lunch, so I can share with you <laughs> the inside of an animal, okay? This is an experiment done at Fred Mumsall's lab. This is a normal male. He's got kidneys, he's got a bladder, he's got testes. This, what, this is the control. Um, here's what happens if he's exposed to bisphenol A, low parts in the womb. This animal in a few days would have died because his bladder would have exploded. His kidneys have gone necrotic, it's still a male. What happened? Well, it turns out the animal can't pee anymore. It turns out that that exposure in the womb affected a key piece of tissue in the urethra, which is the tube through which the animal pees. We have urethras too. So it affected a key piece of tissue early in development, changed the epigenetic control, the ways the genes are being turned on and off in that tissue, and caused it slowly to contract and squeeze until the animal, late in its life, could no longer pee. That's a superb example of how events in the womb can lead to serious adult problems. So um, quickly moving on, uh, exposures are ubiquitous, and they take place in mixtures that interact in unexpected ways. Um, the Centers for Disease Control has really been the leader. The U.S. CDC has been the leader in analyzing how ubiquitous exposures are. Uh, hundreds, they, hundred, they measure hundreds of chemicals in people. Many of them uh, are endocrine disruptors, not all. And we know that at any given time, based on their work and other work, at any given time, there will be thousands of chemicals in all of us, some portion of which, 10%, 15%, are likely to be endocrine disruptors. Um, that list of chemicals is growing rapidly. Um, there are 12,000 new chemicals uh, added to registries every day. Not all of those go into commerce. Um, but what we know from studying uh, the chemicals that are already in commerce is that if we begin to look at the structure of these things that are moving out and into products, many of them are implicated uh, and more th than we would expect. Mixture, the mixture issue uh, is complicated. The scientists have been spending a lot of time trying to figure this out. 
I just came back from a meeting in Denmark where some, some brilliant science was prevented. We're making progress. I'm going to show you one early experiment that demonstrates that um, things don't happen quite the way you would expect. This is an experiment w which had uh, 11, which had it used estrogen, estradiol, the natural human estrogen, and it combined that with 11 weak uh, synthetic estrogens, uh, mostly pesticides and uh, a couple other things like that. Um, and so if you look at that and you say, well, what happens if I put them all in, in one uh, in soup and expose these cells, this was a cell experiment, expose these cells, what will the result of the common combined effect be? And you might think that um, the com combined effect, I don't know if you can see the blank, can you see the, uh, okay, um, the column on the far, on your far right, it doesn't show up very well, I apologize for that. Um, so you might think that that would be the result, but in fact what happens is it, the, the, each of those chemicals, each of the 11 weak uh, estrogens, w the level was adjusted to be beneath the level that by itself it causes an effect. But when you do that and you combine it with estrogen, it doubles the estrogenicity of that compound. So. Um, how am I doing for time? Ten more minutes. Oh, great. Uh, the, I would spend a little bit of time on this because it's really vital you understand it. The tools that we have used to assess risk are blind to some of the things I've just summarized for you. Um, and I want to ask, well, how is it the regulatory toxicology mixed this, missed this? And, and what I would say is that as good a job as they're trying to do, the process of regulatory toxicology depends upon standardized assays, which often are decades old. And, and you, you can't deal with some of the phenomena I've summarized today, the cutting edge academic work is, is, work is focusing on, with old tools. It's sort of like, so imagine, you, how many of you have seen pictures from the, of the Hubble Space Telescope, the, the pictures of galaxies out in space? How many of you have seen those? Okay, so imagine you, you, this first time you see one of those, you say, that can't be true. And so you grab your binoculars and you go out in the backyard and say, see, it's not true. That's what's happening here. People are using old assays to try and look at 21st century phenomena. It can't be done. Um, actually, I don't need those pictures. Um, so that's, that's a key part of it. A second part is that there's some assumptions that are used in risk assessment, assessment uh, that, are, that, for example, underlie how you calculate what, what a daily uh, acceptable intake is. Uh, one is that there are safe doses, that there is a safe dose beneath which exposure is okay. The second is that the dose response curve is, if it's not linear, it may be curvilinear, but at least it's not mo non-monotonic. Now, mo non-monotonicity is a mathematical concept. It means the, the shape is like a U or an inverted U. What it actually means is that the sign of the curve changes, excuse me, the, the slope changes sign as you move along the dose response curve mathematically. But um, all of regulatory toxicology assumes there are, non -monot there are monotonic dose response curves, that the inverted U and, and the, or the U-shaped curves don't occur. Um, and not only that, but they, that, that allows them to assume that high dose testing can predict low dose results if the curves are monotonic. Um, those assumptions have, have just now recently begin to, begun to be challenged. Um, but even still, the doses that are predicted to be safe, once you do your regulatory testing and you figure out what's the daily acceptable uh, exposure level, that is actually, that level isn't tested for safety because it's usually about a thousand fold beneath the lowest dose that's, done, that's run. Now I want to show you some results um, from uh, a lab. Uh, looking at tamoxifen, how many of you know what tamoxifen is? It's key to treating breast cancer. And the reason why it's used to treat breast cancer is shown in this graph. Uh, this shows the response of the growth of a breast cancer, human breast cancer tumor, to tamoxifen. So at high levels, tamoxifen really knocks out that breast tumor, right? That's what you want. So let's move down the dose response curve of tamoxifen. And you can see here that um, you can establish the no observed adverse effect level. It's the first exposure level that doesn't see a significant difference from the control. Okay, makes sense. You're moving down. So that then allows you to begin to introduce several safety factors. One, because rats aren't little animals. One, because kids are different from adults. And one, because there are differences among people. And that takes you to 
a safe level of exposure based on that calculation. Does that all make sense? That's a classic example of how you apply safety factors to a toxicological experiment. The problem is, for regulatory toxicology, the problem is that this scientist actually did a full dose response curve. That's what happens with tamoxifen at lower levels. And at the very level where tamoxifen was predicted to be safe is the level at which tamoxifen is most stimulatory to breast tumor growth. Okay? That's a problem. Why is that? Well, it turns out that as scientists now know that as you move up the dose response curve, the suite of genes that are being turned on and off changes. That's a st classic result in endocrinology that guarantees that you can't predict from high dose experiments what's happening at low doses because different genes are being turned on and turned off. And in fact, at this highest dose here, it isn't an epigenetic phenomenon at all. It's overt toxicity. It's killing the tumor. And that doesn't involve changes in gene expression, period. So if you are depending upon assays that are looking at that sort of endpoint, you completely miss the epigenetic phenomena that take place at low, at low doses. So if we then go and calculate, based on this, these new data, what the safe level of, of bisphenol A is, you establish another no observed adverse effect level, uh, and there it is. That's what's safe. None. So um, these curves are really comp. These, this is standard endocrinology. Suite of genes turned on and turned off changes across the dose response curve. Standard endocrinology. You learn it in endocrinology 101. And so the big challenge has been as we've recognized that. Some contaminants behave like hormones. They follow the rules of endocrinology, not standard toxicology. That's a big deal, and that's where the rubber hits the road with endocrine disruptors. So um, there's some bad news in this message. A widespread exposure to compounds that interfere with gene expression, sometimes at extremely low levels. It happens. Um, today's epidemiology and toxicology is ill-equipped to deal with these effects. But there's good news, and uh, I really want to leave you with that message. I cut out most of it early on just to follow Jackie's admonitions. But what this means is that, as, like I said, if, if diseases are linked to genes, we now know there may be ways to prevent them through eliminating the exposures that hijack gene expression. That's awesome. That's hope. That's something we can do we are going to have opportunities to prevent some diseases that haven't been perceived before as preventable. Um, what, what's next? Um, we've got, there are many scientific questions left. There's, this is a great time if you're a scientist. This is a wonderful issue to be in today. Um, but I think we know enough now to start incorporating what we already know in a new generation of precautionary health standards and also to work with green chemists so the next generation of materials not only provide economic opportunity but protect health. We can do that. Um, if you look at today's human epidemics, here's a partial list. There are scientific data showing plausible links to endocrine disruptors to virtually every one of those diseases. Now, in the end, we're probably going to learn that endocrine disruption is irrelevant to some of them because the science is moving along. But some of them, we're going to learn, actually, it is one of the prime drivers. And we need to be dealt that using this science to guide policy and to take us into an era in which our kids are healthier. So thank you.